You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour. And we are here with our second week discussing Agatha Christie's The Body in the Library. We are discussing chapters 9 to 13 today. I am in the hot seat. Herds is the one causing catastrophe for me. What? Catastrophe? Yeah. I'd say a quaint murder mystery about old ladies and young ladies and policemen who are very competent and have, have correctly identified the Competent? Gun. Clearly, obviously. I'm sure that whoever they, they end up picking will be 100% That's correct. That's very presumptive of and you, no Hertz. no one will need to be saved from the hangman's noose. <laughs> that would be crazy. Anyway. <laughs> I wanted to say, mm. I thought this stretch of chapters was phenomenal for Miss Marple and very few other characters. I was going to say, Miss Marple, like all of the notes I have are like, wow, Miss Marple's really cool. I actually enjoy getting to see her character for once. I know. Like, having not read the you know the original text of the, or the short stories, yeah. like getting to see her be because obviously the the main characteristics right are that she is gossipy yep. old lady quiet like that's mm. what I've known about her. But what we insert here into this stretch of chapters is her compassion. Yeah. Um, which because obviously we have all these scenes where we see other characters be gossipy throughout the village, but all those characters like, did you hear about this awful thing and that awful thing? But Miss Marple wields this gossip like a compassionate bazooka I know. to save the person who she believes is in the most trouble. Well, is, yeah. Is when, the Bantry. when I was speaking with Ankita Rathur about Miss Marple, we were talking a little bit about how the reputation of Miss Marple as mm. gossipy is kind of derived from the fact that for women in the day, there wasn't really mm. any, any other way to get access to situations other than being Social? nosy and gossipy. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So it was really nice seeing that come about in a way that wasn't reliant on some of the more negative tropes about gossipy people. Yeah. It was yeah. really awesome seeing her, as you say, come in and like use gossip to defend someone who yes. she believes yeah. should be, you know, left out of this situation in yeah. the form of Colonel Bantry. Well, she's almost like a she's she's a foil, I guess, to to Mrs. Bantry, who yeah. has the opposite approach where she says, My goodness, I love murder mysteries. And now there's one in my house. How fun. My <laughs> husband's off staring at the pigs in the barn all day, every day. I, but isn't it great for me that I have a murder in my house? I really enjoy the dynamic that those three characters have. I think it it might even be the highlight of the book for me, Flex. I'll be I'll be real honest Ooh. with you. Speaking of things that are alight, oh. uh, the car. Oh yeah, there was a car. Uh, <laughs> Bartlett, <laughs> the Minoan fourteen. Yep, found found in the quarry. That was really interesting. Mm. I mean, I mentioned last episode that we had a few chapters break between when it was announced that the car was found and yeah. actually seeing it. And it was even more chapters than I thought it was going to be. I thought it was going to be the one that we picked back up on, but it's like another ch chapter even after the start of this stretch. That's why I, I have to confess that when you started talking about the quarry and the car being found in the quarry last week, I was like, wait, how do you know about that? That hasn't happened yet. That's not for you, ages. You thought I was cheating? Hans? No, I didn't think you were okay. cheating, but I was like, I don't remember that like being in the book. I had to like flick through my notes like, oh yeah, it is mentioned like way early on. And I feel like it's it's because it is such a like gruesome event of mm. the car like being exploded and set on fire yeah. and like the lone foot that that we almost had to be prepared for it. Right. I did also like the way that the police officers were discussing the crime because they came into the situation and they were talking about it in a way that was very much framed in the standard police coming in and being like, oh, well, this one's open and shut, boys. Mm -hmm. We can really just walk on from the scene of this one. Which it is, obviously. Which, and, which, yeah. which it is, but <laughs> the thing that I liked about it is they come in and they say all of that tropey stuff and then they say, ah, uh, yes, very open and shut, the fact that she was put in this car, driven here and killed, mm -hmm. right? You know, they aren't oblivious, but... Christy is still having them play to those tropes. <laughs> the policemen, they show up on the scene, they say a bunch of dumb nonsense, and then they leave. <laughs> Whereas with Miss Marple, it's kind of been the opposite. We've had most yeah. of our time be with the policemen, and then Miss Marple will come in and say something really astute. One of my favorite quotes in the book is like, one of the characters says something innocuous, and mm. then the narration says, you know, Miss Marple turned to face the speaker. Yes. And it's like, that's all the line has to be. Oh, and it's it, so good. It plays really well with the, the, uh, it's the, the Knox rule of like the, the detective must not conceal any of their thoughts yes. from the from the reader. And obviously, we don't want to sit here listening to Miss Marple's internal monologue, mm. but we can get an idea of how she's feeling and what she's thinking by these very short, very succinct narrative passages. I love the restraint. It's beautiful. 
yeah, you've reminded me of a line. It's a very different flavor, but very much the same portrayal of Miss Marple where uh, Christy has her say, gentlemen, and then the author's comment says, as she said with her old maid's way of referring to the opposite sex as though it were a species of wild animal. Uh, <laughs> she's corralling them. That's amazing. Uh, I love that. I love the narration in this novel. It's yes. really quite wonderful. I think the other thing that was good in that same scene, though, was them discussing the kind of motives behind the crime. And Mark uh-huh. Gaskell, I loved Mark in this scene. He's a good boy, isn't he? He's, he's a good old boy. I don't know if he is a good boy, where he's like, <laughs> oh, you know, I really wanted to wring her neck. And I suppose that people probably thought that I had. And then someone so says, funny. by the way, how did she die? And Mark goes, uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny because there's that whole scene between Mark and, and Adelaide uh, who are I suppose they're they're suspects, you know. Who knows who who could have done what? But like, yeah, Mark is very aggressively like, wow, I really wish that I killed her. Mm -hmm. Though obviously I didn't, (laughs) haha. Yeah. Whereas Adelaide is playing kind of the opposite side of that with, oh, you shouldn't say that sort of thing. I would would never. I'm too permanent proper to have killed anybody. I'm sure we haven't read any murder mysteries lately where uh, a clue has been mentioned by someone and the culprit has tried to shush them. You have that question of, is it all an act or is there a killer hiding underneath this friendly or e- or even antagonistic facade. It really ties in nicely with the portrayal of the club that Josie and Ruby were working at because there very much is that question of like, was Ruby genuinely a nice young girl looking to that's what make her says. way in the world or was she a rampant gold digger like Adelaide and Mark seem to think? And that's what everyone says. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like that's the thing. The only character who says that he likes her to some degree also has this like weird personal emotional attachment because of his dead daughter so yeah it's it's messy it's messed up it's great i think the other thing that was really nice and messy in this was with conway jefferson there's a line from miss marple where she runs through the crimes that have happened so far the death of mm. pamela reeves of ruby Keane, and she says and perhaps even a third murder yes. and the people in the scene with her go oh miss marple don't don't say that now there could be a third murder and miss marple's impossible. like miss marple's like i'm serious and i think i know who it's going to yeah. be it's like if there isn't a third murder then what is what was that line for you know it's yeah. great yeah. there is there's obviously going to be at least an attempt at a third murder mm-hmm. um and i thought that it was it was really fun the way that that entire scene was framed by these personal opinions that we're talking about yeah because what ends up happening is that that line ends up very loaded Mm. and depending on how you interpreted all of the personal motives in the chapter going up to it that loading is going to be very different sure sure yeah i'm very excited maybe maybe you could predict who the who the third murder might be it could be anybody it could be anybody it could be me could be you? I don't think so. I don't think, think I'm in this book. Agatha Christie poisoned the 200th page of the physical copies of this book. <laughs> That's it. It's the secret third murder. Well, you think that they take that sort of oh, no, they... defect out of the book, though, by no, no, now. No, no, no. They, or is it like every millionth book that they sell? But hers, I mean, no, it's a bit high. It's only the library copies. <gasps> because then you're the body in the library. The library. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> well. Mystery souls. <laughs> so if you if you've picked up a library copy to put read along back. with, yeah, put it back. Go buy one. Get it somewhere. Else. That's a terrible scam, actually. Like if you try to like borrow the book for free, you get poisoned. <laughs> That's terrible. That does seem up. The... That seems a bit uh, a bit rough, a bit unethical I mean, to drive sales. Agatha, I feel. Agatha Christie. I wouldn't put past put it past <laughs> Agatha Christie to be that classist. I mean, you know what? Come on. Yeah, how, yeah. how many times do we have a well-featured, you know, lower class person in an Agatha Christie novel? When do they show up? They don't they aren't even in the but stories. There's Edwards. He's Conway Jefferson's valet and he exists. He says things. He Does says he? People have. I don't actually know. If you he's sure he's line. not just a cardboard cutout that's like printed out and stuck? He definitely behind Conway's does that. Wheelchair. He definitely pushes the wheelchair. He might be a robot. Maybe that's the true mystery. <laughs> oh, he's the um. What was it the ma- the mannequin from uh from from the Crooked Hinge? Ah, uh, um, of course. That makes sense to me. Let's uh let's have a look at that when we get there. But Shout. before we do, herds, we mm. have to. Uh, we ha- well, I have to solve a murder. mystery. You haven't even posed one decent theory. I know. In the whole two weeks we've been doing this, one, the week, the one from last week, it was terrible. I mean, that's how the first week theories go. Yeah, though, just herds. like you know, Josie and Mark Gaskell are secretly into each other, and there's, they killed people. Look, it's dumb. It's yeah, just, there's, a, there's a huge a red hole. herring. There's a huge hole there. I mean, let's get into this in the mystery section, herds. I think I'm ready. 
You're listening to Death of the Reader. The Body in the Library by Agatha Christie is the novel we're discussing, chapters 9 to 13. Stick around for more of that. You're listening to your Murder Mystery World Tour here on 2SER 107.3. You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour. We are here discussing Agatha Christie's The Body in the Library up to chapter 13 today. And we're joined on the line today from over in the UK by Moira Redmond, a person who you've probably heard a little bit about from us when we've had Jim Noy and Brad Friedman on the show and has been a conspirator with them in a little bit of, uh, I I suppose, chaotic discussion about Agatha Christie. Uh, that I've been enjoying very much. And I'm so excited to have Moira on the show today to join us for our own little chaotic Christie discussion. So Moira, r- welcome to Death of the Reader. It's really nice to be with you. I love a chaotic discussion. <laughs> so <laughs> It's terrible. You guys need like a, a name, like the, the the second Detection Club, Detection Club 2.0. I don't know if we can take that, but you guys need a name to identify yourselves. Yeah, I think Martin Edwards would sue us at that. I think so, yeah. <laughs> Uh, now, I suppose we should start by talking a little bit about your blog, Clothes in Books, because it's a premise that I think so many listeners would absolutely love, because I know, you know, with other murder mystery fans out there, like Carolyn Crampton over at She Done It, doing a wonderful job looking at women's stories and crime fiction and how it informs the way we, that we read, and your blog uh, kind of began, you were just saying to us, with the body in the library uh, looking at how fashion in fiction kind of codes the characters that we talk about. Can you tell us a little bit about how that kind of kicked off? Yeah, I, I was just, I, I love clothes, I love books, I love crime fiction. And in fact, when I had the idea of doing this blog, the weirdest thing for me was I thought someone must have done this already. I cannot be the first person to do this. So on my blog, I like to find a passage in a book where clothes are important. I like to find a picture that would illustrate that, usually a photograph of fashion of the time that might be what someone is wearing and then I discuss the book um the thing I love above all things is clothes detection um where somebody uses some aspect of clothes to um to help solve the crime and so one of the very first books I ever had on my blog was Body in the Library um Miss Marple being a busybody yeah I I think it's really interesting because like Christy to me is a writer who is very sparse in the way that she writes clothes. There's not a lot of detail in there, but it's very clear in the way that when she does write about it, it's important to her. For example, like the second book we ever covered on the show without actually saying what Christie's solution was, was uh, The Floating Admiral, where each writer of the detection club posed a different solution. And I remember Christie's solution in that specifically related to a fashion description that someone had given of the character earlier. Uh, And I thought it was really interesting that like for how, as I said, little she writes about clothes, how much they matter when she does. That's a really good point. I'm really impressed that you've noticed that because yes, Dorothy L. Sayers, for example, um, there's a moment in Gordy Night when she describes a dress to ridiculous length. Um, uh, you know, it's purple figured. It's a style of three years ago. It's the hems up to here. Now, Christie would never do that. Never. But it's not really relevant in the Dorothy L. Sayers thing. And you also think, why didn't she just show it to people? She's asking them. But Christie, when the clothes are there, wow, they're, they're, they're spot on. Um, but she doesn't go into long, detailed descriptions. It's all. It's much more about the detection. Um, as in Sleeping Murder, where the maid says she's supposed to have packed up these things and run off and left, but she would never have packed those things together. She didn't take the right underwear to wear with that dress. She wore a top that would be with a different skirt. Um, so the maid knows that she hasn't run off. I think it's I think it's curious that, uh, as, as Flex has pointed out there, that Christy focuses relatively little on, on fashion. Because, like, the way that I read books... I don't really think about clothes myself. Like, obviously, it all paints a picture of a character, but it's not something that I remember characters by. I most remember them by the roles in the story rather than what they look like or even what their names actually are, which is fun. But when, when we come to, to Christie adaptations, which I'm, I'm hoping to cover a little bit later on in the, down the line in the show um, of, of Body in the Library, like fashion and the, the costuming of, of all the characters in those shows is always so important even up to the most recent adaptation of Death in the Nile, which had like the red dress 
Um, and the, was it like a pharaoh, like bridal outfit or something? It was something well, crazy. let's not say that that one mattered too much. That was very but much still, a set piece. Well, <laughs> it, well, that's what I'm saying though. Like, even if it, it doesn't matter to the, to the story, it's kind of expected at this point that Christie adaptations, Golden Age detective ad- adaptations will have that sense of, of style to their costuming, I suppose. The, the one that I found really interesting that you've reminded me of there, Herds, is actually when we had Brad on for the first time speaking about... Uh, the Halloween party uh, adaptation for ITV's Poirot is that they did a lot of legwork for the audience in clarifying who was related to who by what colors people wore. It's great. <laughs> That's a good Brad touch to have recognized that, isn't it? But yeah, I think, that, I mean, part of the appeal of the, of the Agatha Christie's is the clothes and the settings. They've made them look really beautiful, even though they've frequently changed the time scheme. They've put, they know that the marbles, they tend to put them in the 50s, the pirates in the 30s, even if that's not when the book was set, but because they know they can do a beautiful, a beautiful dress or a beautiful outfit or a beautiful style, that they've actually changed the date. I think just for that reason to make to make the clothes fit. I guess then let's go straight into the body in the library itself because I think one of the things that I loved most is the way that we spend so much time transitioning from seeing Miss Marple as a background character and the police are really doing the detective work. She's just brought in basically as emotional support for uh, the other characters in the story to then her kind of slowly taking over the book. I thought it was like such a, a natural way to introduce a detective of her flavor compared to her showing up and just immediately upending the police with no no kind of reason for her being able to do so. Yeah, and it's um it's it's very interesting. If you're reading it and you're not solely trying to solve the murder, because I've read it before, um, you kind of get a bit lost as to what's the timeline here. What if you suddenly tipped up a hotel with Mrs. Bantry? Um, how long has passed? How much time has passed? And it's not really super clear. She's also very big on those, you know, the village comparisons. She doesn't do that so much in some of the other books, but there are endless of them here. Um, and so, yes, it's it's the use of her in this book is very interesting, I think. So I guess um, the, the only other sort of question that I, that I was curious about, Maura, we've just finished Chapter 13 on this show. Uh, what what was it about chapter thirteen that started you started you off blogging about it back in the day? She got changed. So the dead girl, the dead the dead girl who's found in the library, why demands Miss Marple was she wearing an old dress? She'd have been wearing her best dress. Girls do. So the policeman then says, no, 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 because she was going out and maybe she was going out in a car. She didn't want to risk her her new frock, her best frock. Miss Marple turned on him. No, 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 no. Um, I don't want to be snobbish. Now, I'm sorry, but yes, she does want to be snobbish. She loves being snobbish. So I will raise on that, but anyway. Um, a, a nice girl, a well-bred girl, would have got changed into a pullover and slacks or tweeds to go on an outing. But Ruby wasn't a lady. She belonged to the class that wore their best clothes, however unsuitable the occasion. But I thought, this is just great. This is the, the top police, and they can't see this, that she's wearing the wrong clothes. And um, what was she wearing, I wondered? What would, what would you wear for this? Um, and so that was the very, one of my very first blog posts, Miss um, mm. Marple and her snobbish remarks about yeah. common girls who don't, get, who don't dress properly. I love that. She's, yeah, she's very big on this, that in the country, you must wear the right clothes. In town, you must wear the right clothes. And that you, never the two shall meet. It's, it's so great, too, because it says so much, I think, about the way that Christy kind of portrays Miss Marple in that she's both... At the same time, very down to earth, but is also completely engrossed in the like cultural norms and has that level of understanding. And the, the like gossipy nature of her character means that like this policeman is like upending years of debate that she's had with her friends on the matter, right? <laughs> Absolutely right. Yeah. She knows young women, um, as she explains, deals with well. them all the time in village life, but she knows what they would be wearing and she knows that. This young woman would not be wearing that dress for a date with someone who is going to be a murderer. Moira, thank you so much for joining us here on Death of the Reader. Coming up next on the show, I have to pose the uh, the last answer, my best guess, before we get on with the rest of the story. And uh, he, he's hoping I can put that to good use before I do. No promises. <laughs> this is going to be a wild, bumpy ride, I'm sure. 
<laughs> well, it's been so nice to to um to meet you and to be on here. Thank you so much for asking me. No worries. We look forward to having you back some point further down the line. We'll have a link up. Uh, on the podcast to your blog if people want to go and check it out. You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour. We'll be back with more of The Body and Library in just a second. Don't go anywhere. You're listening to Death of the Reader. Flex and Herds here for your Murder Mystery World Tour. We are back with Agatha Christie's The Body in the Library, chapters 9 to 13. It is the part of the show where I have to pose a solution and Herds laughs and cackles I do. as I roll slowly into my metaphorical I have, grave. Um, I have my pipe here. I'm ready to hold it up and, and cackle maniacally like the witch that I am because I am secretly Miss Marple. Are pipes a, a famous part of, of witchcraft? Is they are it? now. Okay. I guess I guess brooms also work, but if I had to like be posed from the waist up, I would use a pipe instead of a broom. I feel like that'd be easier to like pose with, you know? Yeah, no, that's, a, that's yeah. an interesting thought. But otherwise, it's just like the broom head. That's pretty boring. We were talking uh, towards the end of the first section of the show today, Herds, yeah. about how my theory from last week was terrible. absolute trash. I agree. You need to come up with a better theory. Faster, more extreme, more red, I would say. More red. Yeah, because red goes faster. Uh, of um, course. So you need to come up with a theory that isn't nonsense. Yeah. The thing that was obvious to me with yeah, my yeah. theory last week mm-hmm. was that the the motive, You've and you, you, something. Did, you yeah. did question me on this, mm. the, the method, rather, by which they were able to get Ruby and Pamela into... <laughs> their respective their locations. Their respective locations. Sure, yep. What I said was I thought that Josie was, you know, well and well equipped enough to deal with and have people trust her. Mm. But, you know, that's that, I think, is really more the role of Conway Jefferson. I think, Herds, that it's much more likely that a harmless old man who can't use his legs yes. is able to get the trust of two young women yes. than anyone else in this Look, story. I was look, I'm 100 percent on board with this. I think this is a much more competent theory because otherwise, why are we spending all this time with Conway Jefferson talking about how he can get across the room and use crutches and like like why doesn't he just sit in the wheelchair all day? It's because he's secretly a killing machine. I want to disagree with this. Herb. You gonna disagree with me? I gave you a perfect doubt, you're gonna turn me down. No, no, because I don't think Herds that despite his 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 covering for mm. his accomplice. Oh, that he uh, actually did the crimes himself. You're going to pick Edwards, are you? No, no, no. That would be a truly terrible theory. Well, think about this, Herds. There's a character in this story who we've accused of being far too obvious, mm. George Bartlett. He's, oh, he's Bartlett. nervous. He danced with Ruby. He owns mm. the car that Pamela was found in. It's true. And he's into murder mystery. And as we know, in murder mystery, the rule is, mm-hmm. and there is never any alternative to this fact, it's true. that if you are the murder mystery reader in a murder mystery novel, you are involved with the crime. Can I throw a wrench Please. into that? Because Peter Adelaide J- Jefferson's son is also into murder mystery. He has signatures of all the great murder mystery writers, including Agatha Christie. How does Peter factor into your... Your, your hard, solid rule that you've just established live on air. Well, because he obviously went to school with Pamela Reeves. What? And managed... And Lord, huh? He picked the target for <laughs> his for his uncle. And a good member of the, the youth of the family does try and keep their older patrons feeling sprightly. But what Peter doesn't know <laughs> is that Conway was up to something. Oh, no. And he had an accomplice. Trouble. Trouble. And that accomplice was George Bartlett. Uh-huh. Owner of car. <laughs> Who, I like that that's his title. Do we know anything else about him? Uh, he's an idiot who owns a car. Yeah, he's an idiot who owns a car. You're telling me he reads murder mystery novels. I don't even remember that detail. I'll be honest. Maybe I made that up for the sake of this. <laughs> I think you may have. Obviously, Bartlett is is pretty nervous, right? He's messed up. Uh-huh. What has he messed up, Herds? He, clearly, he's messed up the fact that it's actually the small child who reads murder mystery. Well, but... let's ignore that, Herds. <laughs> oh, no, it's fine. This is very cozy. <laughs> yeah. Um, he's messed up the yeah, crime, Herds. Okay, he's messed up the crime. Okay, tell me what what is the crime? The crime. What is the crime in this crime novel? The crime is the murder <laughs> of the crime is the murder of the two women. Herds. Okay, why is he murdering them? Because he's being paid off by Conway. By Conway. Why because is he paying? Why is he being paid by the old embarrassed man? Embarrassed about the quality of his car. That's why he agrees to burn <laughs> the Minoan well, that's fourteen. Fine. Look, I grant you, Bartlett's involvement. Mwah, solid, <laughs> no chinks in the armor. But why is Jefferson? How much is he paying Bartlett 
to not have to give fifty thousand dollars to the person who is replacing his daughter and he loves and cherishes her. What what is why does he want this poor girl killed? Because her because he is broken from what He's happened broken. to him. He's broken both physically and mentally. He's broken. And he craves to take away from other people what was taken away from him. What? You've got like... Look, I, I, I want to point out, though, this is a flawless argument, but yeah, I have some small niggling questions. <laughs> your wife for this mystery covers Pamela Reeves very nicely. Yeah. But for the actual character... The actual core of the mystery <laughs> covers nothing. You've covered all of the clues. You've covered like Bartlett and his weird car yeah. obsession. You've covered the car itself. You've covered the quarry. You've covered Pablo yeah. Reeves. You've covered Jefferson. Mm-hmm. You haven't talked about his kids, but that's fine. They're not even involved in this. They're a red yeah. herring. You haven't brought the cops in. I don't know how you would do that though. Well, tell you what hurts. <laughs> yeah. I'll do it in one. Okay, do it. Ruby's dad. Yes. Who is Colonel Bantry? Famously. Is Colonel Bantry? No, no. Famously uh, absent from I history. Go, I would go with is Colonel Bantry. Well, I mean, that's not a terrible guess either. It's a pretty good guess. I, I, I could work that. this in. You know what? Let's work it in. <laughs> Let's workshop this. Is Colonel Bantry. Oh, that's why he's in a strong. Why he's down with the pigs? Exactly. Oh, oh, who? The pigs are a metaphor. Had to cover up his past life as an airline director. Oh, my goodness. This upon, is getting deep. Upon which the Jefferson family no. was flying. Dude, you know what this is? What? Gossip. Gossip? <laughs> this is gossip. <laughs> <laughs> it's beautiful. Uh, it's flawless. I couldn't like, tie it up in a little bow, a little plane crash shaped bow. Yep. And uh, ship it off. Thank I think goodness. Chrissy will be proud of that one. I don't think I can keep um, up this act for much you longer. You get full Herds. points? No. Oh, are you telling me that's not your real theory? No, well, I'm going to go with. Theory. I'm going to go with my first week theory uh, as my final answer. Probably, for, uh, probably sensible. Probably sensible. <laughs> probably a sensible thing to pick. Uh, but I did like the Bartlett Jefferson theory. I didn't think that you could tie those two characters together so neatly. It was. Um, it was genuinely difficult coming up with an alternate theory for this book. It was. It's, it's, it's one just thing, so obvious. Not that. <laughs> not that. It's that. The novel does a very good job of making all of the most plausible motive theories mm. being the most implausible how to do it method theories. theories. Oh, method. Yeah, that's another way of saying how to do yeah. it. Yep, I like it. Kind of once I realized that in the first week was when I caught on to the novel. I was like, well, none of these things make sense, but this one that's slightly more difficult yeah. to get away with is 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 obviously going to be the catch. Can I ask you, obviously I can either confirm or deny any, anything at all of what you said, either this week or last week, but my question is, like, Miss Marple has said a lot of things. Yes. What do you think is the most important thing she said about the body? Because we've talked about how Christy's whole thing in this book is that she's sick of these library mysteries that are about the library. She wants to be about the body. So what is the clue about the body that you think is most important? Curiously, I did have an answer prepared for this. I do have a point. I'm putting a point on this just so it's clear. This is where the fourth point is going. I want to say it's the nails. Oh, ah, interesting. Why do you say it's the nails? Partially because Miss Marple spends a whole stretch of text, I forget exactly how long, saying, Well, it definitely is curious that the nails were left in this short state. What I'm what I'm going to pin it on is that whoever planted Pamela's body. Mm. in the Bantry's library Mm. was trying to make it look like uh, Ruby's body in the car. Sure. Because I said last week those two were switched. Okay. But I, as a reader, don't understand why that was necessary. That's right. I like like this. I will mull over that particular point. I like your theory. I like that you thought about the body and the yeah. nails in particular, because frankly, you could have picked pretty much any aspect of the body and like convincingly sold it to me, I think. But I will, I will mull over this answer to see how many points you get yeah. next week. But I, I like your chances. Cause, I like your cause, chances. Cause what I think is going to happen is that Miss Marple is in next week's episode mm. going to say, well, it was the nails that gave away that the corpses were swapped, but sure. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> That's very funny. Oh, well, we will, we will have to revisit it next week. I think But yeah. I'll, I'll have a mull over. I think you're, I think you're on a knife's edge for that one point out of four. We won't talk about the other three, Uh-oh. but that particular point, well, I'll have a think about it. Yes. Um, but yeah, for next week, we will of course be covering chapter. Was it 14? 14. Chapter 14 all the way to the end 
almost exactly a third of the novel. So mm. yeah, read on of The Body in the Library by Agatha Christie. I'm looking forward to it. Hurts. Thank you for guiding us through this book. Fun. Regardless of how massacred I get on the points front. <laughs> of course. I have had a Chopped grand diced. a grand old time with what feels like a classic quaint mystery. Mm, yeah. Well, we'll see how we go. We will indeed. This is Death of the Reader, your murder mystery world tour here on 2SER 107.3. Agatha Christie's The Body in the Library concludes next week and we will see you then. We're out of here. We're done. 